asymmetry in games. Well, I designed already some games with the theme of asymmetrical game and player powers. And I <clears throat> like that role play characteristics to that. So each player start with a unique set of abilities with um, skills with benefits with disadvantages sometimes and different strategies and that gives me a complete different player experience than any other player on the on the board um, even though we might compare uh, compete about the same resources or um, actions or whatever you you're competing for uh, it feels like my game is substantially different than yours and I think that Gale Force 9's Dune from the, I guess, late 80s had that. Like, they really, really went in really deep with asymmetrical player power. So one player is allowed to look at the cards and the other one. And I like that really much is the Emperor is collecting all coins spent in the game. So... He has a steady income of coins without doing any effort for that. And I really like that <clears throat> idea of having each player have its unique way and strategy of um, approaching a game and a problem. So for the Emperor, there's no problem having money, but there's a problem of you do not control how much and when you get the money and I, th I think this is a really interesting way of designing a game around asymmetrical player powers and of course the game root um, also gives so much different approaches to the same idea of conquering these um places in, in the forest also vast where another one player can play the the cave and one plays the um uh, what what's the name the thief and you know it's really interesting having this kind of different player experience in the same moment on the same table which draws a lot of attention from a lot of people and Give them pleasure because they say oh i i've really like to see how you play the game how i would play the game when i play this one and so on so there is something that has a unique appeal of asymmetrical player powers that a lot of people look for and there must be something like a psychology grounding to that and I guess it's individu individuality. So you want to be individual. You have you want to have your own your own stuff. The, the, a, a power only you have that makes you unique and special. But what I also found is that a game like a deck building game that starts off symmetrical very very f uh, uh, quickly becomes way more asymmetrical than asymmetric games and in, in, in the first hand so let's have like a dominion a, re a regular dominion uh, session so you all play, start with the same cards in hand 10 cards and the first card you buying may be completely different than another card another player uh, buys and from that on, not only have you different abilities in the same deck, but you will also crawl in different directions with your strategies. So after like maybe four or five rounds, the decks are so asymmetrical, no asymmetrical game could ever have. And I find that really interesting to analyze this and say, okay, so having symmetrical player powers and an engine building aspect to it, and for also for example Puerto Rico, where 
one player can totally go for the sugar or the coffee, another player stays with the, the corn. The, 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 the point is, even though you're starting symmetrical, the player powers start asymmetricalized way faster than any asymmetrical game can. How is that? And I think uh, one of the answers to that is if you, if you as a game designer design an asymmetrical game, you'd say, so you have like six, four, seven, ten different ways to approach a game. And here's a way to play the game in one way. Of course, I give a lot of variety, uh, hopefully, in, in an asymmetrical path, path. But the game itself must be stable to compensate for the asymmetrical player pause in the first place. So the game designer open up 10 or 15 different ways, but then is railroading each player to one rail. And symmetrical player games don't do that. The game designer offers like 40, 60 or maybe 80 different ways or variations to play the game. So think about Dominion. If you go for uh, uh, one of the, the cards in the first row and you have like four of them in your deck and the other player is aiming for a card from the second row, which is of course stronger, but also he gains it very like later in the game. Or think about uh, Dominion, uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, Dune Imperium, uh, where when I go for my first Bene Gesserit card that says, if you ever reveal another Bene Gesserit card, mm -hmm, gain this. So what I will do is go for another Bene Gesserit card. You that have maybe a card from the Fremen and that says, uh, if another Fremen card, da, 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 you go for Fremen cards and we both now start looking at the same game at, from different angles even though we started off symmetrical. So engine building always have the tendency to broaden up the game. Like I use one engine and then put another engine on top and then put this and this. This gives so much more variation than any asymmetric game can do in the first place. So how come both have their own way of balancing. So the way for symmetrical games of balancing these all these different ways, of course, is play test and experience. So you have to play a lot of time, let's say 100 times, to see if there's one winning path, one winning strategy. If you do this and this and this and this, you always automatically win. And if you get rid of these auto wins situations, you can be sure there will be different ways of winning the game. Another very important thing is that you have to have different ways of earning victory points if you, if you have a game with victory points, but let's assume you have. So you have to have multiple ways of having different ways of earning victory points. So in... Um, Ruins of Anak, for example, the cards itself you, you're going to buy have their own victory point value. Of course, they are very few, but still they can give an advantage. If you go for uh, hunting the, the guardians or you're going to um, explore more, more new areas or you're going to have the science track up, all of this is already asymmetrical, but all players are allowed to approach it on the same way. And this is the difference from an asymmetry game, because in an asymmetry game, the game designer already pre-pathed my way of experiencing the game. So even though if we have unique abilities where 
one player plays an insect uh, swarm and the other one plays a bunch of five combat suits that really gives off role-playing vibes, very asymmetrical vibes. But as soon as I open the game, the swarm have its own inherent problems and also problem-solving skills. So, of course, I can have my units in every area on the board, but the chance of holding it will be very small because, of course, the game designer de defined an insect swarm as very weak uh, individuals, but very strong in a, in a swarm. And the big ma mech suits, of course, will be inverted to that. So they have very high individual power uh, instead of having like a huge army to control. But you already railed. So let's say the five mech, mech suits, they have, they know that they can only like conquer or hold a certain amount of areas at the same time. So if you have five units, in best you can control five areas at the same time, at any given time. If you combine two in an area or have one unit in operational on the board or in an area you don't control, you already smallen your your ability to control areas. Let's see the insect swarm by default can maybe split up into 15 groups that are still okay -ish in their in their values. They can hold a lot more areas. And that's what I mean. Um, you are railed for a different kind of strategy even though you have already even though you have a lot of variety in gaining victory points or in the way of playing a faction. But just from the fact that the game designer already predefined a, where, a path through the game for you um, narrows the, the, the different options and uh, or, um, possibilities you can play the game, even though it feels different. And that's why what I want to talk about in this video is like the psychology, the, the psychological effect of feeling unique and special with asymmetrical player powers and also the huge effort of learning all these different rules because pretty sure most asymmetric games tend to have special rules for every faction that this player has to know, but also all other players on the, ta on the table has to know. So imagine in a game of four players, <clears throat> I have to learn my rules and the rule sets of three other players. Compare this to a symmetrical game where you only have to understand one rule set and then you learn by playing the game, you learn how the game evolves from that. So when another player gains a power that allows him to have another worker, for example, we all learn this at the same time, the player itself and all other players on the table, which gives us an advantage of understanding the impact that may have on my play. In an asymmetric game, on the other hand, if I gain my very huge dragon creature to the to the board what does it say to, well, what does this mean for me as your opponent opponent is another dragon helpful how helpful is this does it increase 10 percent, 15 or 20 percent of your power or does it affect me at all what is the special rules and so players need to learn way more things other players do and also new rules I, ha I, I can uh, um, give to the game other players have to learn. So asymmetry game, games tend to have a constant update on rules that are distributed decentralized like that like 
you have a board, I have a board, you have a board, and we have four four boards on the table. And a lot, I I need all the information on the board, uh, but I only have a one a, a quarter of the information on, on on my side, and this adds to the depth of a game, because. I have to learn all these different rule sets. I have to learn how they interact with me. So the really fun part of asymmetric games is not in the engine building itself. It's in how well can I understand my rules in comparison and in addition to all other player rules on the table. And this adds to strategy, tactics, understanding and gives you sometimes a, f a feeling of I be ahead of the game if I understand all this. This makes me feel clever and that's what attracts people to asymmetry games. But you can see like if you lack those skills or you're looking for like an easier evening, that's why asymmetry games are still some kind of niche compared to symmetrical games. No matter how good and well balanced and designed they are, they have initial flaws that appeal to some people but push away other people. It's like small games address a lot of players but will also push away other players. That's quite normal, though this is not a disadvantage, it's just who is your audience. And no matter how well done a game is, as soon as you have asymmetrical elements to it, you already, you're immediately increasing the complexity of the game, even if it's just one simple rule, like say, all players always have five cards in hand, except me, I have six, but only me. So it's a, it's an, a, a, um, um, an accept, accept, um, exception to a general rule. And all players on the table have to understand this exception to the basic rule. In symmetry games, all exceptions are always publicly announced and also all players can ha have equal chances of gaining them. So let's say you have a game in which there you can have different buildings, like Puerto Rico. Two players in the whole game can have a harbor. The two first players having the resources and the will and the action to build a harbor can have a harbor. So the first time a player buys a harbor, mostly all players have seen what a harbor can do and they are prepared that now one player can use this ability of the harbor. Others don't. So who's second having a harbor? And players can decide, do I aim for that second harbor or do I aim for another building? For example, the Hacienda, which allows me to always have a, 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 one, a worker on a newly planted plantage. And as it's public information for everyone, it feels we have, feel like we have equal chances of understanding and equal chances of getting these bonuses. The same with uh, deck building games. Like um, I played a lot of Star Realms and the interesting thing is that the market is of course very high in variation because it fluctuates all the time and you have like new uh, cards go coming in and old one going out and you see a lot of cards and you always in your head checking if does a card resonates with my engine I already built it or I want to build. And that's where the magic comes from. We both have the same chance of having a really cool engine. But in general, symmetrical games offer players on the table 
the illusion of understanding everything from the beginning of the game. Because I learn one rule set that is true for all players. And the first actions start negotiating with that concept, but on a very small fractured level, like I do, I buy this, I install that. And that's where the asymmetrical path starts to open up. And if you compare a game of Puerto Rico at the end of a game and see how different each player is built, you will find they are so diverse that you feel like they play different games. But you are tricked into the, the belief that all rules are the same for all players. One of the games I really adore and play a lot of times is Blood Rage. And uh, this game makes it perfect, perfectly for me. So uh, if Eric M. Lang, you will ever hear that, you did an amazing job with this game. I, I, Blood of Rage is on my top three games of all times because of the chance of having a really strong, unique ability combination I can build because we all have the same chance of having a specific card in hand and install it. And that's where the magic starting from. I, I always play as the Raven Clan because I like the color and the, the logo. And I feel like every time I have a Frick's Blessing, I guess it's the name in English, um, where you have like the rage costs for all updates are minus one. As soon as I have this card, I feel lucky. You know, I really feel happy that I now can see my path for until the end of the game. If uh, for another player, if they see, okay, I can have the, the ice throw, they start, yeah, now my game starts running because I have the ice throw and so on and so on. We, we all start as a boring Viking clan, but as soon as we install our first upgrade card, we are separated. We are not the same Viking tribe again. And that's because of one simple ability that distinguishes us from each other. And that's what players often like. They want to feel special and unique. And a game like Blood Rage does this perfectly. Because you learn one rule set and then you start changing the rule set, but in small steps. And that's why you take all players always along the way. Yeah, and I, I really uh, like that. And I often look in, ga look in games for mechanics like that. That's why I really enjoyed to play Dune Imperium. As it's not as strong as Blood Rage, but the deck building character really, really starts driving uh, interesting, interesting ways. Like, how can I achieve of buying the Spice Must Flow cards? No, really, I, I, I always try to aim for having two at least, and I always try to find a strategy and a chance to have three of these cards in my deck by the end of the game. And I only managed it once in like, I, I don't know, 20 games. And I felt really happy that I finally managed to do that. But I never did it, you know, I never came, um, reached that point again because the game is so diverse. And that's, that's what really, really is interesting for me. Even though I'm as a game designer, tend to start off asymmetrical. So yes, three of the four games I, I released are asymmetrical. And I know why I did that, because I like the storytelling part of it. And here's maybe an interesting point. Some game designers and 
you know, not sure if it's true, but I guess also Cole Worley, he's also a storyteller and uh, a story world builder. And game designers that also have this sense of storytelling love the chance of having asymmetrical factions. Not because of the mechanic, mechanical options. Of course, we, 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 of course, they like it to define unique player powers. But I think the, the true, the more, the more true part is you can have narration and story. So it's not just the blue player. No, it's the, the raven. And, they were founded back then and all this. Think about the cats in Roots. Even though they have only a few sentences of backstory, but it immediately starts storytelling in your head. And this is the real magic of asymmetry gameplays. It's not in the mechanics, because what I said is you are more railed than in a regular game. You are railed and stick to one strategy. But what you really like is the storytelling part of it. And that's what I like too. I like having this story as a player, but also as a game designer, because I want to tell a world or a story inside my games. And I guess a lot of game designers do. They have an idea in their head and they want to create a game that resembles this storytelling. And one of the great examples is Scythe. So here's this guy having these really, really interesting illustrations of this alternative uh, European uh, wo World War I theme. And Jamie Stegmaier probably seen that and say, oh, that's a really nice story world. I want to create an uh, area control in game in there. And as soon as he started having the idea of having fixed factions like the Rusviet or the Nordic tribes, he started telling a story inside a board game and Deriving from that, having player powers, asymmetric player powers. So I, my, my workers can swim over rivers, yeah, but I can take the same action twice. So mechanically, we already have different player powers, but the idea is it feels different because it's a different story. And we don't want to have like a generic red faction. We want to have a Russian faction with abilities that match the idea and the story behind it. And in symmetrical games, the game designer and also the players are limited in their understanding and their, their chance to telling a story. Not like you don't tell a story, but it's not like you can drive it. I cannot enforce it. If you starting off as a yellow player, what's the story I can tell you? You are the owner of a plantage. Good luck. You are the yellow one. Because I cannot know what's the first card you install. If you install the Hacienda, I can say, oh yeah, now you're the, the, the lord of the Hacienda. And now we have storytelling. But at this point, there's no interaction between the play and the, and the player anymore because you are the yellow player and that's your strategy, that's your story. But as soon as I want to tell a story and having like cool illustrations and cool stories and cool characters, I need to have the, as a game designer, I need to know that one player exactly plays this setup I writing a story for. And yes, so if you a game designer or a player um, attracted to storytelling, asymmetric games ap um, appeal to you as there is storytelling in there. And you feel like, oh, when I as Rasviet does uh, do this, it feels different than if the 
Irish tribes does the same because it's the Irish tribes and I'm the Roosevelt and you are the Irish tribe. So yeah, we both have our own storytelling. I can write a small introduction. Who is Connor? Why is he leading the, the Green faction? Um, who's Olga? And so on and so on. You, re you can write text and players can read the text and feel immersed in the game. And that comes with the price that not all rules are true to all players. Thank you very much.